So, we have begun a series entitled, Love Is and Love Isn't. That's an important thing for us to know, especially because people in today's world use that term so freely to describe a lot of disparate people, circumstances, or situations. Makes it all the more important for us to know what the Word of God and the mind of God says about what true love is and what it says that it's not. And so we began last week by looking at the first characteristic of real true love, and that is that it's patient. And the second characteristic that is mentioned there is that it is kind. Have you ever heard the phrase, killing them with kindness? Yeah, does anybody know for sure what it's from? Does anybody know? Anybody think they know? It's very interesting. It's from a Shakespeare play where you read, She shall watch all night, and if she chance to nod, I'll rail and brawl, and with the clamor keep her still awake. This is the way to kill a wife with kindness, and thus I'll curb her mad and headstrong humor. That's where the phrase originated, killing someone with kindness. I do not like the phrase. Because it seems like to me, whether you use anger or kindness, the goal is still to kill someone. So I never have quite understood the phrase, kill someone with kindness. Uh, you know, it relates to kindness, I suppose, but it also relates to anger. I think we'd all be better off following the phrase, kiss them with kindness. That seems a lot better, and maybe that's why in the early church, they were told in Romans chapter 16, and one of the least observed commands in Scripture, salute one another with a holy... You see, most of you didn't even know it. Usually when I do that, the whole audience responds. And some people said, the Bible says kiss each other? Yeah, it does. Salute one another with a holy kiss. That's kissing them with kindness. Very, very different. I heard a story about a man who stopped at a highway diner for breakfast and a grumpy waitress came out. If you've ever stopped at a, uh, oh, what is the famous breakfast place? There's one at Waffle House. If you've ever stopped at a Waffle House, you know what that's like. And a grumpy waitress came out and said, what do you want? He said, well, I'd like two eggs and frankly, a few kind words. She didn't say anything. She just rolled her eyes, turned around and went back to the kitchen with the order. In a few minutes, she returned and slammed down a plate with two greasy eggs and just sort of stared at him. And he said, what about my kind words? She said, if I were you, I wouldn't eat them eggs. Probably the best she could do. Sometimes good religious people can be as mean as a snake. Now, through the years, we've had lots of restaurant servers in our congregations, some who were adults, some who were just uh, in college, some who it was their first job as a kid, still in the youth group. And I've had many of them tell me that the worst time to work in a restaurant is on Sunday right after church when the church people come in. And some of you will remember that there was a fad a few years ago where you don't leave a tip, you leave a church tract instead. Oh, that's going to impress them. That's certainly a kindness they're going to remember. And so when I heard that a couple of times, I left church tracts or church invitations with like a 30 or 40 percent tip. That would be much kinder, much better to do. I agree with a little girl who spent all day with some of those good religious people and during her bedtime prayers, she said, dear God, make all the bad people good and make all the good people kind. Because kindness really is love with its work clothes on. 
That's probably the best definition of kindness I've ever heard. Love with its work clothes on. Now, I don't know if you thought about this as it related to love is patient, love is kind. The first two things that love is, according to 1 Corinthians 13. Patience and kindness appear first on our list, and there's a reason for that. But you have to understand this. Patience is passive. As we talked about last week, patience is the ability not to blow your stack with difficult people and difficult circumstances. Patience is passive. Kindness is active. It's not only not blowing your stack, it's the act of doing something that demonstrates love, especially to difficult people. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior, and you can just draw a line across right there. There's one side, and then here's the other side. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. The Greek word for kindness that is used right here is the word krestos, and it literally means, in the original language, grace in action. Grace in action. And the Bible tells us that God is full of grace in action and loving kindness is the way it is described by sending Jesus to die for us. Romans 5, 8, for instance, says God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Occasionally somebody will say to me, I don't believe in God. They'll find out I'm a preacher, and they'll say, it usually happened in, on an airplane or at a ball field or uh, someplace where you get conversations about Hey, my name is, and you know, hospital sometimes. And so occasionally somebody will say to me, I don't believe in God. And I always say this, why? I'm curious to know. I'm deeply curious to know. In reality, I am. But it also keeps the conversation going. And the answer will sometimes be something like, it rarely is a theological answer. It rarely is a well-thought-through argument against God. Almost never has been. It's always something like, well, my wife got sick, and I prayed deeply for her, and she died anyway. Or my child, who was innocent, got sick with a childhood disease and struggled, and I prayed and prayed and prayed, and it didn't turn out well. Or, you know, I had a storm, a hurricane, or a tornado hit my house, or this, and just one thing after another like that. And so I just simply cannot believe that a God of love will allow such a thing to happen. They usually then talk about a vindictive, angry God who has per not interrupted or prevented some tragedy. And uh, I think I've told you before the story of Ted Turner, the, the mogul, the business mogul and tech mogul and former owner of the Atlanta Braves and lots of other stuff. And uh, he grew up thinking about being a minister. He grew up in a reasonably religious family and actually thought about being a minister. <clears throat> but his sister became sick and he prayed and prayed and prayed and she died and he turned against God and he's been against God and he's done a lot of damage ever since. But when somebody says something like that to me, I'll say, well, you know, the truth is, I don't believe in that kind of God either. I don't believe in that kind of a God either. I don't believe in a vindictive God. I don't believe in an angry God. I believe in a God who is kind, like we just read in these passages. A God who is loving, a God who is merciful, a God who someday will punish sin, doesn't even do it now while we're living, who someday will punish sin, but his 
patience and his love and his kindness has called him to dis delay that because, as the Scripture says in 2 Peter 3, 9, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everybody to come to repentance. His justice will have to be satisfied someday in the future, but now he is opening his arms to anyone and everyone for all times. That's the God I believe in. I see you are describing to me a God who would have had to suspend the entire rules of nature and creation in order to have happen what you wanted to have happen. You're describing a God who, though he didn't choose to sin, would have to suspend the nat not only the natural laws, but would have to spend, uh, suspend the consequences of man's sin in the garden. He cre I said, I believe in a God who created a perfect world. Absolutely perfect. And it could have stayed that way forever, for that matter. But when sin violated the law of God, he only had two choices. And he gave us the choice of free will choice. I heard a story one time of a first grade boy named Timmy who walked to school every morning and at home, he would, and we, most parents have been here with this, done that. At home, he would complain that, you know, he was a little afraid in his, in his times where he'd be perfectly honest with his mama, but, but he didn't want the other kids to ever know that, right? You know, so his mama would be nervous about him walking by himself to school. So she arranged for her neighbor, Mrs. Goodness, to walk along behind him while he was walking with a group of students. And it worked out really great because Mrs. Goodness had a dog that she would take for a morning walk. And so after several mornings, some of the kids noticed that this woman and a dog were following in behind them. And, and one of them said, does that bother you? And Timmy said, no, that's my neighbor, Mrs. Goodness. And her first name is Shirley. And they said, what's the dog's name? And he said, the dog's name is Marcy. And he said, does it bother you at all that she follows us? And he said, no, because every night my mom reads the 23rd Psalm to me and it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. <laughs> Did you see that coming, John? But the truth is, surely goodness and mercy and kindness and love do follow us all the days of our lives. And because he demonstrated kindness to us, when we didn't deserve it, we should show kindness to others. In Luke chapter 8, we read the story of a time when Jesus was in a hurry to get from one town to another, but the stories about his miracles and his power were growing so rapidly that the street was utterly filled with people, and it was making it hard for him to move. And we read that one woman in particular fell at his feet behind him. Not where he could see her, but behind him. And she just reached out and touched the edge of his cloak. He didn't even know it. And immediately, her disease of 12 years was gone. Just like that. And Jesus said... Who touched me? And his disciples said, Lord, look around. We're in a mob of people. Everybody is touching you. And he said, no, I felt power go out from me. This woman who had suffered with a blood disorder for 12 years was a social and religious outcast because of her problems. She was considered to be unclean. She couldn't get near any other person. She was what we would call untouchable. And yet Jesus stopped and gave her his time and attention and healing. And when she confessed that she was the one who had touched him, he said, woman, your faith has healed you. Every day, almost every one of us come in contact with somebody who could use a little healing every day. 
Every day, we encounter desperate people who just need somebody to listen for a minute. And sometimes we interpret that as they're in our way. We tend to ignore them. But Jesus didn't. He showed them kindness. And so when Jesus lives in me, it will produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is kindness, and it will produce real love, which is patient and kind. And it will cause us, because Jesus is living in us, if our enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. And I know we often focus on this part of that, and that is the absolutely worst part to focus on. I've actually heard people say, it's, that's what kill them with kindness is all about. I've actually heard people say, well, treat them with kindness and you'll make them feel bad. Somebody mistreats you, treat them with kindness and you'll make them feel bad. That's not, that may be a consequence of treating them with kindness, but that's not the point of treating them with kindness. The point of treating them with kindness is, and the Lord will reward you. And interestingly enough, Paul quotes this exact proverb in Romans chapter 12 when he is talking about repaying good for evil. What does it mean to heap burning coals on his head? Well, in this case, it simply means that when you show kindness to people who treat you like dirt, they end up burning with shame. Someone has said it this way, love your enemies, it'll drive them crazy. You ever heard that? Love your enemies, it'll drive them crazy. But again, that's not the main point of it. If that is a side benefit or a side consequence, wonderful. But the main point of it is, is because you have the love of God in you and because love is patient, love is kind. And the Lord will reward you that way. So I got to trying to thinking about a time where maybe that kind of thing happened in the Lord's life. And there were obviously so many, but the one that really just leaped off the page in my mind was in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before Jesus is going to be arrested and ultimately crucified. He's praying in the garden, and a mob arrives to arrest Jesus because you remember they've made a deal with Judas Iscariot, and they walk up, whoever Judas walks up and kisses, that's the signal that the soldiers will start grabbing Jesus. And so Judas kisses Jesus, and the soldiers move in to attack and to grab and try to arrest a Jesus. And Peter, always the impetuous one, right? Peter steps forward, and what does he do? He takes out his sword. And he attacks physically with a sword. Now, I don't know what he thought he was going to do, one against all these Roman soldiers. I'm not sure what he thought was going to come from that. But anyway, he, and of course, Jesus told him, everybody who carries the sword dies by the sword. But, and Jesus said, you know, no, that's not the way we're handling this. That's not the way we're supposed to do it. But it's interesting to me that all, that must have been such an impactful event that it's one of the very few events that all four gospel share, writers share with us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them. And I, it, I, that's probably why it was so significant on my mind, because I've just come to the end of writing in Love Your Bible the four gospel accounts, and so I'm very familiar with what's in there and what's not and why they're in there and why they're not. And so, and so John is the only one that tells us the man's name, the soldier's name. All four record it, but John's the only one that tells us the, so, the man, not the soldier, the, the uh, man's name was Malchus. Malchus was representing the high priest. He was a servant of the Jewish high priest, and he was with the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus. And John's the only one that tells us. That was his name. So put yourself in Malchus' sandals for just a moment, would you? You've been told that Jesus is a traitor and an imposter and that he's a 
threat to everything you've ever been taught or believed from the Old Testament and the Old Law. And in the heat of the battle, one of his men pulls out a sword and chops off your ear. What are you supposed to think if you're Malchus? What are you supposed to think? Suddenly your life is basically over because anybody with physical deformities couldn't even enter the temple and he certainly would no longer be able to be a servant of the high priest couldn't do that either basically his life is over we look at that story and we think oh no he's not going to be able to hear out of one ear well listen my son had a tumor a brain tumor uh, 10 years ago and he had surgery and he can't hear one thing out of his ear out of one of his ears not one thing but his life is going on, and he's doing fine, and he's got a great job and a great family, and he's, yeah, okay, so he can't hear out of one ear. That's terrible, but it's not the end of his world. For Malchus, this was the end of his world. There goes his job with the high priest. There goes his ability to even enter the temple. And in that moment of pain and fear, this imposter does the impossible. He reaches down to the ground and he picks up the man's ear and in an act of unbelievable and extraordinary kindness, he reattaches it to the man's face. It's healed. It's restored. What an act of kindness to an enemy that is trying to arrest you. Why? Why? There's only one answer. There's only one possible answer. Because love is kind. Love is kind. Love is not hateful. Love is kind. If we're not careful, our motive for showing kindness to mean people can be to wound them. If you perform an act of kindness to someone who has mistreated you, you may be tempted to think, oh yeah, I got them back. I can't wait to see them burn with shame with coals on their head. Burn, baby, burn. Look at that smoke rising up from their heads. I really showed them. That's not kindness, even though you may have acted kind. That's meanness. And that's what's really in your heart. We should show kindness to our enemies. To bless them. To bless them. Not to burn them. I don't know how many of you know who this man is. His name is Roberto Di Vincenzo. He was, he's a Hall of Fame golfer from Argentina. He's won over 200 golf tournaments worldwide. What he's really famous for is what is these pictures right here is what he's really famous for. In the 1968 Masters tournament, he turned in an incorrect scorecard. And it was just an accident. It wasn't trying to cheat or anything. It was just an accident. Turned in an incorrect scorecard, and as a result of that, had to forfeit. Instead of going into a playoff with Bob Golby, who he was tied with, his mistake then put him into second place, and Golby won the green jacket because of a scorecard error. That's a pretty incredible story, but that's not the story. No, the story's this one. In 1957, he won first place in a tournament after being presented the winning check of $5,000, which in 1957 was a whole lot of money, a whole lot of money in 1957. Uh, he uh, left the, the uh, golf club and was heading out to his car when a young woman came up to him crying, and she told him her child was near death in the hospital and needed some treatment that she couldn't possibly afford to pay, and her story really moved a Roberto, and he took pity on her, and he right there on the spot endorsed his winning check over to her and gave it to her. The next week, he was approached by a PGA official who had been told by the attendants in the parking lot 
of Roberto's encounter with the woman and the official found Roberto and said, I have some bad news for you, Roberto. You've been fleeced. She's a phony. She's not even married. She's well known in this area. She has no sick baby. She fleeced you, my friend. And Roberto said this, you mean there's no baby who is dying? And the official said, that's right, she fooled you. And his only response was to smile and say, that's the best news I've heard all week. When I read that story, I thought, many of us are so cynical and so skeptical, we think everybody who's needy is trying to take advantage of us. We think everybody's trying to fleece us, everybody's trying to fool us, and they might be. But we're not the ones keeping score. God is. We're to be kind, not just because who we are or what, who somebody else is, but because of who God is. And because his spirit is living in us. And you may think, well, that woman tricked him. She didn't deserve his kindness. All right, I'll give you that. Let me ask you this question. Do you deserve his kindness? Anybody in here want to raise their hand and say, I'm so righteous, I've been so good that I deserve God's kindness? Nope. Nope. None of us deserve his kindness and forgiveness. Jesus said we're to show kindness even to those who are his enemies. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus for that? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. Luke records from the Sermon on the Mount where he said, love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. There's that word reward again. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he, the Father, is kind to the unthankful and evil. Jesus said, if you only show love and kindness to those who show love and kindness to you, there's nothing special about that. Even the heathens do that. Can you think of somebody right now who has been mean to you, they've mistreated you, they've talked about you, they've done something wrong to you, your easiest response is to have nothing to do with them? But I suggest if you do something kind for them, not to burn them with shame, but to bless them, God notices that. That's what all of these texts that we've looked at tonight says in Proverbs 21 and in Matthew chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 6. That's what all of these texts have said. God notices that. God rewards that. Let me give you a great example of that. One of the best people our country has ever produced was Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was a highly educated man, unbelievably intelligent man, the first president of Tuskegee Institute, facing all kinds of hatred and abuse as he worked to educate African Americans during the time of Jim Crow laws in the South. He faced things the rest of us can't even imagine. And through it all, this Christian man constantly showed kindness to his enemies and is well known for saying, I shall never permit myself to stoop so low as to hate any man. The only way I can destroy my enemy is to make him my friend. Wow. And so, Kindness pays off. It really does. Can I tell you a story to prove that? A woman in Louisville, Kentucky was standing at a bus stop and she had just cashed her tax refund check so she was carrying more money, more cash than usual. And she glanced around and noticed a shabbily dressed man standing nearby and as she watched, I mean the guy was really, you know, downtown guy, badly dressed, you know, and she watched a man held, walked up to him and handed him some money and whispered something into his ear and walked away. 
And she was so touched by that act of kindness that that stranger had done for that man that she decided to do the same. In an act of generosity and be kind, she reached into her purse and took out a $20 bill and handed it to the man and also whispered in his ear. And she whispered, never despair, sir. Never despair. The next day when she came back to her bus stop, the same man was there again. This time he walked up to her and handed her two $100 bills. And she was dumbfounded and she said, what is this for? And he said, you won, lady, never despair, paid 10 to 1 at Churchill Downs yesterday. Sometimes <laughs> kindness pays off. It can be a good thing to be kind. You remember in Luke chapter 19, Jesus had an encounter with a vertically challenged man? That's what we have to call people these days, you know. All sorts of new names we have to give people. His name was Zacchaeus, and the people hated Zacchaeus because he was a tax collector and he'd gotten rich by cheating them out of their money and helping the Romans and they hated him but Zacchaeus had an itch that money itself couldn't scratch when Jesus arrived in Jericho Zacchaeus was desperate to see him you know adults I have found that a, have you ever you, how many people have ever seen a child or a teenager climb a tree, raise your hand. See children climb trees all the time. You ever seen an adult climb a tree? Now, if an adult climbs a tree, other than John, oh my goodness, well then you're not gonna be happy with what I'm about to say. If you see an adult climbing a tree, he's either escaping a flood or a dog is after him. Or he's Zacchaeus or John. And Zacchaeus climbed a tree for one reason, he wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going to have dinner at your house. And in an act of kindness, he went to the home of the most hated man in the region. And over the meal, God changed Zacchaeus' heart and he promised to pay back four times what he had stolen from anybody plus interest. Why? Jesus' act of kindness. Jesus said, the world will know we are his followers by our love. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, how we know if you love? Are you kind? Are you kind? To put it another way, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. You should sow kindness to everybody, especially those who don't look like maybe they deserve your kindness. <laughs> I'll close with a true story about that. 1956, a poorly dressed man walked into a Cadillac dealer just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. He looked poor, he had a beard, he looked kind of run down, he was shaggy, looked like he hadn't had a bath in a while. He looked around the parking lot for a long time, none of the, none of the salesmen even wanted to go out and approach him. Finally, the owner said, one of you got to go, you go and run him off, get rid of him. And the salesman went out there, but as he got closer to him, the man was so bright with him and so happy to him that he thought, I just can't run this guy off. And so the guy kept asking multiple questions about all these, about these Cadillacs, multiple questions. And the guy patiently and kindly stood there and answered all the questions. And finally, the guy said, um, do you take cash or check? And the salesman laughed at him and said, well, we'll take both. And he pulled a checkbook out of his back pocket and Elvis Presley said, then I'll take six of every color you have of these. The 
because one salesman was kind. We should be kind because Jesus was kind and because kindness is a fruit of the spirit of love and because kindness is a part of the definition of love. We shouldn't be kind because we're burning coals on people's head. But whatever, be kind. Stephen Grellett was an unknown missionary who died in 1855. He would have died in total obscurity except for one paragraph he left behind in a diary. It's the only thing people know of him today. It was the only thing people would have known of him in 1855. He wrote in his diary, I shall pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer it or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Love is patient. Love is kind. Next week, we'll pick up with the third thing the mind of God said about love. You are dismissed.